We are being immersed in the beauty of the divine. And sometimes we may engage parts of his life, which likewise we become immersed inside the majestic nature of the divine, Jalla fil Ula. The Prophet ﷺ is the one who makes manifest, we may we hear the connection, or maybe he wasn't clarified the connection between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these 99 names and the 99 qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the life and times of the Blessed Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallama because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa sahi wa sallama according to one of our great Imams whose name is Imam Suhr Wardi radiallahu ta'ala an is the one who um, lives or manifests all of their 99 qualities in counting and takhalaqa bi akhlaq al-Rahman that's what the great Imam said that he is the one who inculcated all of the qualities of the beneficent, the most merciful that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sallam Wasallam We see a beautiful tradition in, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim Radiallahu Ta'ala An Where our mother Aisha The blessed wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Was asked about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam By Sahih bin Hisham She was asked Kayfa kana khuluq Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam How was the actual character of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she said, Allah taqra'u al-Qur'an, do you not recite the Qur'an, do you not recite the Qur'an? She said, kana khuluqu al-Qur'an, that his character was the Qur'an. And another narration, she said, kana al-Qur'an yamshi bayna al-nas, that she was the Qur'an, that walk, he was the Qur'an that walked amongst people. So when we study the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we study the Qur'an. And when we study the Qur'an, we study Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an being that uncreated word that is representative of Allah, Jalla fil ula Some of the Christian theologians are want to say that if, that word, if God, or the word of God, is imbibed in Jesus, the son of Mary, in Christianity, then in Islam, it is imbibed inside of the Qur'an in and of itself. Okay? That is what the word of God made manifest. And the Prophet Sallallahu was that way that God made manifest. There are many disciplines that we could all choose to study because knowledge is very important. Our tradition is based upon two things, knowledge and practice. And they're both extremely important. Yet we see in the times in which we live in, and we see that the disastrous uh, events that seem to uh, occur inside of the daily life of the Muslim, now, it's important for each and every single one of them to try and seek the cause, the reasons why, and begin to follow them causes so we can eradicate them in order to replace them with causes that bring about some type of success and proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strikes an example of the great Dhul Qarnayn in the Quran, فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبَ That Dhul Qarnayn, that individual, that righteous individual who ruled the east and the west, i.e. ruled the entire earth, one of the only few people in the history of man to rule the entire earth. And one of the things that we see about Volkarnain is the seeking of the causes of things. Why? There's a, there's a great sociologist, English sociologist who died recently called Charles Tilly, who had a book called Why? The reasons why events take place, the reason why human beings do what they do. And that's important for each and every single one of us because the whys in Islam always usually retain back the things which connect with knowledge 
and things which connect with practice. And the beauty of Sierra, Sierra, the, the, the topic that is, is at hand, studying the life and times of the Prophet وسلم, is that it connects with knowledge, all knowledges. You see, it's not fiqh, but you will find fiqh inside of the Sierra jurisprudence. It's not theology, aqidah, but you will find theology, aqidah inside of the Sierra, the life and times of the Messenger. It's not spirituality, the cleansing, purification of the heart or the soul, but in it you will find the cleansing of what? Of the heart and the soul inside of Sira. In fact, that the ulama say that every single discipline that the Muslims have ever brought forth onto the face of the earth needs Sira, taftakir ila Sira, and he's reliant upon Sira in order to bring clarity. Sira needs no other discipline. It is a complete and whole discipline. One of my teachers, his name is Dr. Nur al May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. He's considered one of the foremost hadith specialists today in Damascus. He's in Damascus and Halab. That he's wrote many, many great books, voluminous books in various subjects, especially inside of the Quran and especially inside of the Sunnah Mutahara, that which relates to hadith. But he wrote what we can be considered a pamphlet, less than 10 pages on the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he began to distribute that pamphlet before it was published on many of the great ulama of Damascus, the greatest, the fuhur, the great scholars of Damascus, to which they all added or subtracted. And he eventually edited the text and just and published the text. It's called Al-Nafahat al It's called The Fragrant Breezes, Divine Breezes. Very small pamphlet. But he said, Despite the fact that I've written many books, voluminous books, in various disciplines, that that is the greatest work that I've ever written. Less than 10 pages summarizing the life and times of the Blessed Messenger, وسلم, as well as aspects of his, well, his great features, as well as beautiful features, as well as his moral disposition. So when we study the Prophet, وسلم, we are studying everything. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is that microcosm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. And one of the unfortunate things in which regards to us as Muslims is our ignorance, and I mean ignorance in the real sense of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we said, that our success or failure relates back to knowledge of Allah knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as practice of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, i.e. the inculcation and implementation of his Sunnah. This is the nature of what of where you see the success of the nations of Islam as well as what the fall of the nations of Islam. When they closely adhere to the path, and that's why our scholars will be very, very particular in the ways they choose to call a discipline or to call anything. Very, very particular with regards to names. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about our father Adam, He speaks about Adam in the, in, in the sense that Allah taught him the names. Either mastery of the names, likewise leads to the mastery of the realities that are beyond their names or their names represent. So our scholars have been very, very particular about names. So when they choose a name like Sira, Sira means a, a path that one leads, a, a way of conduct, how one conducts themselves in life, and they take that name and apply it to the life, the life of the Messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi it is trying to um, show us as willing students, willing adherents to his way, that his life and times is very, very, very important. But we ask sometimes they will speak about the ten considerations sometimes we should look at when we study any type of science. I, if you want to study fiqh, there are usually in the beginning ten considerations you should ordinarily look at when you study aqidah, theology, legal theory, or soul and fiqh, or any of the other type of disciplines of Islam. There are usually ten considerations. For most of the considerations is the name. And the name of this science is what is called sira, as we made mention of. Likewise, for amongst the considerations is what they call the wadir, the wadir, the originator of the science. And that's what they say, إِنَّمَا بَارِيَ كُلِّ فَنِنْ عَشَرَ الْحَدُّ وَالْمُوْدُوعِ 
ثم الثمرة والفضله واسمه الواضع that's the middle الواضع the واضع is the one who originates the science and here most of the علماء are going to say that the great originator of the science was an individual called Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and so we can just kind of fear for those who were present inshallah because it's important as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said khatib al-nas ala qadri uqulihim in the hadith of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib speak to people in according to in accordance to their intellects or in accordance to their readiness we want to see where people are at with regards to their knowledge of the seerah so sometimes it's you asking me questions but likewise it's also me asking you questions also so when we hear the name Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas I want to see like those who have not heard of him, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And let's see a hand. If you've not heard that name before, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And if the hand's not up, I may pick you to answer. So, inshallah, honesty is the best policy, as they say. Uh, so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Okay, these are people that we should know. Okay? And alhamdulillah, it's all good. Because they say that, say I do not know, and you will know. Uh, that's what they say, let every list for the ilm. I don't know it's half of knowledge. The problem is when somebody doesn't know and they don't want to admit to their ignorance. That can be called what Imam al Ghazali calls complex. And he says complex ignorance has no cure. Okay? So the one who says, when I studied in Mauritania, the scholars will say, Qul la adri hata tadri. Say, I don't know until you do know. Uh, it's the path to knowledge. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is one of the great companions. And we'll suffice to say that he is one of the ten who are guaranteed paradise. Okay, that's why he's very important. He's of the ten people that the Prophet Sallallahu by in statement, guaranteed that they are in paradise. Although the Ulama say there are more than ten, but these ten, by the word of the Blessed Messenger, Sadiq al Masluk, the one who does not lie, impossible for him to lie by the nature of his innate constitution, his created form, he cannot lie. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam is that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is from those who have been guaranteed paradise radiallahu ta'ala and he is usually attributed to being the originator of the science of the of the Sierra because he used to gather his children and he would speak about the life and times of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he would say Hadihi majdukum that this is your majd your majd means your glory and he's not just speaking to his children you see, it's not related to the khusus as sabab. The ulama say in, this, in, in the sciences of, of philology, that we take into consideration, consideration the general application of what was said, not the particular reason what brought about that statement. I the Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas is not speaking to his children per se. He speaks to his children and beyond to each and every single one of us, that our majd, our glory, is in the life and times of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَنْظُرُوا إِلَى مَجْدِكُمْ He says, ponder deeply your glory, i.e. the life and times of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we would see that this would be part of the way of the early generation, and part of the way of the second glorious generation, and the third glorious generation of the Prophet in Sahih al-Bukhari he said khairun nas qarni that the best of generations is my generation the generation that with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was from amongst the most foremost of that generation thumma ladina yalunahum then those who follow them i.e. their students the next generation thumma ladina yalunahum and then those who come after them as the third generation, the glorious Salaf. And they are glorious because they took care and paid deep consideration to their glory, their majd, which was encapsulated inside of the life and times of the glorious messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. We will see that the ulama are going to, or where we should start with regards to this, is in a sense admittance of our ignorance of who he is, sallallahu wa sallam. And the more we delve into the life and times of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a paradox, the more ignorant we become. I, the more we, we think in the outward sense that we gain more knowledge of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we only increase in ignorance of him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Two of the names that we should take into consideration, the name of whom? Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab. Uh, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, who again is one of the ten who was guaranteed paradise, and is one of the foremost of the companions. It suffices as a praise to Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab that the Prophet wasallam said that if there was a prophet to come after me, it would have been Umar ibn al-Khattab. But there is no prophet after me. This is a great Umar. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu many times that he will make a statement and the Quran will be revealed verbatim in the words of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab. That's i.e. the word of God corresponded to the words of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab such that we see a second great individual we should all likewise take care to note whose name is Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib would say that on the tongue of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab was an angel called Sakina. Either every time Umar would speak, his words would be angelic, such as it was as if he was like a puppet, and the puppeteer was an angel called Sakina. Okay, Ali bin Abi Talib is another great individual who we should all know likewise, a very, very yeah, complex individual, such so that we see the latter days of Islam yani, are somewhat, I um, wouldn't say the word divided, but saying Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali, becomes that problematic figure which causes a band, a group of the Muslims to misinterpretate his vast and complex reality such that they become Shia an. They become a group that secedes <laughs> from the main body, the body of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, due to the complexity of that great individual, the father of Ahl al Bayt, the brother of the Messenger of God, وسلم, the one who the Prophet placed in the station of Harun, Haruniya. He said, You are to me just as Harun was to Musa. Salam. That's the great Ali bin Abi Talib. Huge, great individual, the one the Prophet وسلم, called Bab Medina to the Ilm, the gateway to knowledge. That's Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. And Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, despite his rank, and Sayyidina Umar ibn al Khattab, despite his rank also, both of them were instructed by the Messenger of God وسلم, to go and seek out another individual. This is the fourth name we will hear today. And his name is saying the Uwais al Qarni. Uwais al Qarni. Uwais al Qarni is from the second glorious generation. And according to many of the scholars, they consider him the greatest of that generation. I, in the same way we may speak about Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr, the great Abu Bakr, has been the greatest of the first glorious generation. Many are of the opinion that it's whom? Sayyidina Sa'ad, Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarni, who is the great one of the second generation. And if we don't know names, then we don't know names. But many of us who may study the life and times of great people, we may hear the likes of Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Musayyib, radiallahu ta'ala an, who is the, the most knowledgeable person of the second generation. He's the forefather of the school of Imam Malik, radiallahu ta'ala an, the Imam of Medina in his time, the son-in-law of Sayyidina Abu Hurair, radiallahu ta'ala an. But they consider Uwais greater than him. Many of us hear about the great Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu ta'ala, and the one who was born and raised in the great city of Medina al Munawwara, and his father was a servant in the house of one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu and his mother was a servant in the house of another of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu and he said, as a young child, I used to jump from the, the two roofs of the houses of the Messenger of God sallallahu between my father and mother. That's the great Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu ta'ala, and that the, 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 the people of spirituality all endeavor to treat their lineage or their transmission back to that great individual. Yet despite his greatness, and he is great, radiallahu ta'ala, and this individual called Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarni was considered greater. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed these two great companions, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, to seek Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarni out. He's somebody who lived in the time of the Messenger, but Allah did not foreordain for him to meet the messenger. That's why he's not from the first generation. Although he lives in the time of the messenger of God, Muhammad, he never meets him, even though his blessed feet would stood on the great soil of Medina. 
When he stepped inside of Medina to Munawwara, the Prophet ﷺ had gone outside of Medina to Munawwara. And he was faced with a great dilemma, a dilemma that many of us would not pay due consideration to. Why? We're not people who follow the seven. These causative reasons that we gain knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the creative acts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our limbs. Why? When he's in Medina to Munawwara, he has what? Two, two choices. First choice is to wait, sit and wait. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ has gone, but surely the Prophet ﷺ will return because the Prophet has an ultimate retaining place is that blessed piece of land that is considered the blessed land, that blessed land where he now resides in the entire cosmos according to the absolute consensus of the scholars of the Muslims, that blessed place where he resides now ﷺ. So he will return, it's just upon saying, oh, wait so currently to remain, sit patiently. But he has another option, and it's a dilemma that he faces. What is that? And that he is in the great servitude to his mother. He is a hardened to his mother. He looks after his mother. He's from Yemen. He's from the Yemen, and he's left his mother for a short while just to see the blessed messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then to return back to the service of his mother. When he doesn't find the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Medina, does he sit and wait, or does he return back? It's an easy choice for many of us when we sit 1500 years later, but for somebody of the stature of Sayyidina Uwais al Qarni, who understands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's obedience has been encapsulated in the obedience of one's parents, he heads south and returns back to the obedience of his mother, radiallahu ta'ala, and, and it's that and many other things that render this individual great with Allah. Great with the Messenger of God وسلم, and great with them people who seek the proximity of Allah and His Messenger وسلم. So Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab and Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib after the death of the Messenger they continue to try and seek this great individual just to ask for prayer on the instruction of the Messenger of God وسلم. and Abu Bakr who becomes the first leader he comes and he goes back to Rafiq al-A'la after two years and then Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab becomes the leader of the Islamic Polity. And when Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab is the leader of the polity, he would gather, gather all of those who were in the Hajj. And he would tell the people of Hajj that everybody who is not from Yemen sit, and they would all sit. And then he would address the people of Yemen, those who remain standing. And he said, let all of the Yemenis sit, except the one, those who are from the tribe of Qarn. Qarn. And then the people of Qarn, the Qarnis, would remain standing. And then Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib would address the people of Qarn and said, Afikum, amongst you is there amongst you an individual called Uwais bin Amr al-Qarni, Uwais the son of Amr al-Qarni, to which they would say no. And this would become the regular annual duty of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab and Ali ibn Abi Talib every time, every Hajj. Until on one Hajj, they begin to get the message that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam will not instruct them to seek except that that individual could be sought, could be found. So they begin to say that it's not going too well here. So when the people of Qarni remain standing and they say there's nobody from amongst those called the ways of Qarni, Sayyidina Umar asked, is every single one of you here? Are you all here? To which they say yes, except one um, individual that we pay no attention to, who we have left looking after all of our goods out on the outskirts of the city, saying, no, Umar ibn Khattab said, I said, everybody bring him. And when they brought him, shown off, that was whom? The great individual, Uwais al Qarni. The Prophet had described as somebody who had been afflicted by leprosy, but then he'd been cured from leprosy, and all that remained was like a farthing's amount of that leprosy on his cured body. And, and that's why we see the great hadith with the Prophet وسلم, talks about those type of people who are on the outskirts, the ones who people pay no attention to. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there are many eh, disheveled, <coughs> impoverished, barefooted, worthless individuals, those who are rejected at the doors of people, one you would pay no attention to. Were they to demand from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, demand, not us, demand. Give me right now, 
Allah would give them whatever they demanded. And when you hear or you study that hadith in the science of a hadith, that they always interpreted that hadith through the story of Sayyidina Uwais bin Amr al-Qarni radiallahu ta'ala. And when Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab addresses him, I enter Uwais al-Qarni, are you Uwais al-Qarni? To which he answers in the affirmative, despite his deep, modest disposition. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I am Umar ibn al-Khattab, and this is Ali bin Abi Talib. And we've been instructed by the Messenger of God, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to seek you out and just to ask you for dua. To which the first thing he says is, Adhakarani bis. Did he mention me by name? Say the Uwais radiallahu ta'ala and said, Did the Messenger of God mention me by name? To which they said, Yes, he mentioned you by name. Fabekha Uwais. And say the Uwais then begins to cry profusely. By virtue of the fact that the Prophet sallallahu mentioned him by name. Not just by name. So therefore we rewind back to the likes of Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas whose name was mentioned often by the Messenger of God, but also he guaranteed the likes of Sa'ad paradise. So what about saying that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas? We see that the Prophet wasallam, when he mentioned the great companions, some of the companions would stand and they would dance in the presence of the Messenger of God, the likes of saying that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and others, by virtue of the fact that the name of the Messenger of God وسلم, was mentioned. Look at our great mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, and when Allah mentions her situation in the Quran, she forgets creation. She goes into a state of what the spiritual uh, masters call obliteration, annihilation, where creation disappears, and all she sees is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her father Abu Bakr in Hadith al Bukhari, he says, Ushkur Rasulillah. Show Gratitude to the Messenger of God because he is the intermediary that Allah spoke about your situation. And she said, La ashkur illallah. I only show gratitude to Allah. And Ibn Abi Jamrah, the great Andalusian Spanish scholar of Bukhari, he says that what is this obliteration? She cannot even see the Messenger of God because now it is Allah speaking directly about her. Always get a portion of that, a portion. In that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned him by name. And then he says the context for Sirah. And what is the context for Sirah? He says to Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab and he says to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib that you know nothing about this man, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except his shadow. That's it. That, that's the, the limit. That is the limit of your knowledge about the Prophet وسلم, his shadow. And as we will read, if you, if you encounter the great characteristics of the Messenger of God وسلم, he was of those who cast no shadow. He has no shadow. It's as if they are telling Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab and Sayyidina Ali, you are absolutely ignorant about who he is, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And we don't see Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab saying, watch your tongue, do you know who I am? I'm Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Sayyidina Ali saying, yes, he is Umar and I'm Ali. Who are you saying we don't know nothing about the messenger of God? That they lower their heads in humility, in recognition of the truth of the words of Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarni uttered. That is how we start Sirah, that is how we finish Sirah. And Sirah is a subject, as we heard our dear brother mention in the beginning, that we must engage from the beginning of our lives as children, hearing the first words of our mothers. Likewise, until the day we die, when you go to any of the great traditional societies of Islam, that the mothers, even when the child is in gestation inside of the wombs of their mothers, that the Sirah will be read aloud so that the child can have can embrace the great life and times of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Something from the cradle to the grave, min al in al mahad as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in al from the cradle to the grave, knowledge should be sought, as the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So when we look at Sirah, there are many different disciplines that one could study with regards to Sirah, possibly in the early days, although in the latter days, when sciences are somewhat being, in a sense, um, dis, yeah, categorized into various different sciences, that now you study them as individual sciences, but it gives us, in a sense, um, a clearer picture of what we should engage when we study the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first is his life and times, which is ultimately is what we're going to look at, his life and times. And the ulama are going to debate about when does this begin. 
It's a subtle debate. I, when you study Sira, where should you begin? The end is pretty obvious. Al-Rafiq al-A'la, Al-Rafiq al-A'la. When it returns back to what? The highest, the supreme complete. They were the last words of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But where is the beginning? There are going to be many of the greatest biographers from amongst the great Imam al-Shari who had the most comprehensive work on the seerah of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As well as another great individual whose name is um, Sayyidina Yusuf bin Ismail and Nabahani radiallahu ta'ala, the great Lebanese judge who preferred to what to begin the life and times of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the beginning of creation. Uh, that's when they began. Uh, because that's when he first began. I've seen the beautiful tradition, Meta Kunta Nabiya. When they asked the Prophet, وسلم, when were you a prophet? And he said, Kuntu Nabiya wa Adam bain al ma'i wa team. Wa Kuntu Nabiya wa Adam mun jagilan between eti. That I was a prophet whilst Adam was still between water and clay. Or I was a prophet whilst Adam was still being formed in his clay, his outer form. This is what the Prophet said, and this, according to the scholars, is not in the knowledge of God. This is what an existence, a spiritual existence that the Prophet had in what? In time immemorial. So you'll see many of the scholars, this is where they begin that great lofty story. And likewise, we'll see others, and they are the majority who are going to begin it in terms of not his spiritual existence in times are gone, but when he manifests into the, into, into the air, manifests in that blessed city of Mecca to Muqarramah. Okay, that's where most are going to begin the blessed story. And then we're going to study the life and times of the Messenger of God وسلم, in relation to the message that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted him with, and in the context of his people, who are in, in the genetic sense, the Arabs, the Arabs of Arabia. The second is going to be in the context of the land in which he, was, he resided in, which is Arabia in and of itself. And the third most important aspect is the context of the language in which the Prophet has spoke. These are very, very three important considerations that we will always look at when we gaze into the life and times of the Messenger of Allah in a sense as a historical phenomena. Okay, historical phenomena. That's Sirah. So we will study the Messenger of Allah but we'll also study various types of people. We'll study his family, we'll study his forefathers, those who went before him. We'll study his tribe, and we'll learn that his tribe, although the Prophet ﷺ is an Arab, and it's impermissible for anybody to say that he's not Arab, but he's also not Arab, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, because he's from a unique band of the Arabs that are called the Musta'arabah. And the Musta'arabah are Arabicized non-Arabs, that's who they are. They are non-Arabs who become Arabs by virtue of their fathers who are non-Arabs marrying into the Arab lineage, i.e. marrying Arab women, and thereafter living in Arabian society and adopting the Arabian tongue. That is the lineage of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of may pay that no mind, but that's very, very important when we learn that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the only universal messenger. He is sent to all people regardless of race, regardless of color, in all times and in all places, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joined the two worlds from the perspective of the Arabs, because the Arabs only see the world in two terms when it comes to race. Either you are Arab or you ain't. That's the Arab worldview. I the word Ajam in the Arabic language means anybody who is not an Arab. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is Arabi Ajami. And this, he has the ability now to convey the word of God to all people. Because if he was an Arab alone, many civilizations would find a good reason to reject him. A good reason to reject him if he was not yani, applicable to them in terms of race. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it different in that regard. So we study about his people and about his origin, about his forefathers, who they are, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak about his forefathers? وَتَقَلُّبُكَ فِي السَّجِدِينَ That you are what? تَقَلُّب means how you yeah, they alternate or you sojourn through the loins of your forefathers 
who are sad GD, people who fall prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very, very important to understand that not one of the forefathers of the Messenger of God was somebody who ever prostrated to an idol. Not one single one of them. Very, very important. And we're going to see that the Prophet وسلم, when he stands in Qurayshi society, he stands in Qurayshi society as the one who has the most glorious lineage of any of those who are present inside of that society. Because when they're not so, they may, those people who are aristocrats in that society, may have found good reason to reject them by virtue of his lineage, but they found no good reason, as we see in the Hadith of Abu Sufyan in Sahih al Bukhari. Okay, so these are considerations we also look at in terms of his life and times, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Oh, in terms of others, I mean, look at, we look at his forefathers, we look at his tribe, we look at those who stood for him from amongst them clans, and we look at those who went against him from amongst them clans, we look at some of the outlying tribes of Arabia, those who needed the call of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa because they're very, very important when you hear like a year called the year of the delegations, where all of the varied Arabian tribes from the north, south, east, and west of Arabia will all begin to move onto Medina to Munawara in order to stretch their hands forth to the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, very important considerations. Who were the great individuals who followed them? Who were those great individuals, in another sense, who rejected him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? What was the faith that he brought? Is the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a bid'an min al-rasul? Is he an innovator? Is he brand new, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or is he part of a very, 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 very long continuum? Part of that continuum, and how do we study him in the context of that continuum? How do we study the Prophet in the context of Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus' son of Mary? Very important because he's the last Prophet who was manifested on earth before the coming of the Messenger of Allah. And he's the one also, yet even by this Mu'u, Ahmed, he's the one who gave us glad tidings of the one who will come after me, whose name is Ahmed. Ahmed being the name of the Prophet. In the heavens, Ahmed fi sama wa Muhammad fi al-Arab. He is Ahmed in the heavens and he is Muhammad upon the face of the earth. So we have to study him in the context of Jesus, that great Judaic messenger. Lest we forget the Prophet, the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam is a Jew who comes to the Jews. He's not universal. And that is why it's important when we study religion to see why when the religion of Jesus manifests in the world of the Ajam, world of those who are non Jews, because the Jews also have that dichotomy. You're either Jews or you're Goy. You're either a Jew or you're a Goy, you're a non-Jew. Now when it, the religion of Jesus manifests in the world of the Ajam, the Goy, that it becomes corrupted, distorted, because it will do by nature, because Allah didn't reveal it to the non-Jews. He revealed it solely for the Jews. Jesus comes as a messenger for the Jews. Yet when we see the religion of the Prophet ﷺ, the universal religion of the messenger of God, manifest beyond the Arabs, we see that it's what? It's like water in its natural habitat. It's natural to every type of people on the face of the earth. We have to study these contexts, although we have a thematic look at this era due to the brevity of our time. Another great discipline, and let's go through some of the disciplines that we look at in Sira. The next consideration, which is not looking at the messenger of God in a historical phenomena, we now look at the messenger of God abstract. I, what did he look like? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa wa sallam, and how did he behave? And that is a beautiful science that they call Shama'il. Shama'il. And then just like in the same way that saying a waste of karmi can become ecstatic and cry because tears are of two types. The Arabs are what they call qurrat al ain They call the coolness of one eye. And that's the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. Yani qurrat al-ayun. Jazaan bima kanu ya'malun in surah al-sajda. About the one who won't stand by night in prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ukhfiya lahum. He does not know, has no knowledge of what Allah has hidden for that person. Min qurrati a'yun. From that which will cool in one's eyes, i.e. make you cry cold tears. What are cold tears? Cold tears are what you call tears of joy. Because the human being has two types of tears. Warm tears and cold tears. Cold tears are happiness, a sign of happiness. Hot tears are a sign that somebody is sad in a, deep, in a state of sorrow and grief. So here that we see a way to cry is cool tears because he's mentioned. Why was he mentioned by the Prophet? Because he was one who mentioned. 
the Prophet ﷺ, that is an appropriate reward. Those who mention shall be mentioned. And see, and shaman as a discipline is a great discipline in which you learn to habituate your tongue upon the mention of the messenger of God. ﷺ. You learn to habituate your eyes to read great books, works like this, the Mawlid of Imam al-Barzinji, as an example. A great Mawlid that all it does is speak about the seerah and the shama'il of the messenger of God. ﷺ. What is amazing that 1500 years after the fact, people can still take a lot of care to write anything about the messenger of God They don't write it on a scrap of piece of paper, but they will try and write it in the most loftiest and best manners as we see in this great way that people should ultimately go out and buy because it's what is glorifying your great messenger Those that mention shall be mentioned. So we look at the great science of Shema'al, we ask how does he, what does he look like I mean really, what does he look like? And if you do not know what he looks like, then how then can we find him? How then can we single him out? Those who are privy to understand how the Messenger of God looked like. They were like those who came into the city of Medina, as we hear in the Hadith of Sahih, and they couldn't distinguish him from his companions. They couldn't tell which one was Muhammad, and that is an illusion in terms of him. To his own what humility, but likewise, it's also an allusion to the ignorance some people have about the Messenger of God, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The children of great generations, where they asked to draw him, they could draw him exactly how he looked, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many paid deep attention to how he looked. When we see the great tradition of Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, the great companion at the time, Sayyid Umar ibn Khattab, when he goes on to Caesar, the great Caesar of Rome, and Caesar of Rome, he asks, he says to Abdullah ibn Hudhafa, he said, I know what your companion looks like, i.e. the Prophet Muhammad. Abdullah ibn Hudhafa said, you're Caesar in Rome, and he's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi never stepped foot in Rome. How, how is it you know that he looks like? Prove it. So to which Caesar summons one of his guards, and they bring a portrait of the messenger of God, a portrait, and Abdullah ibn Hudhafa said, who are who? That's him. That's him. Eh? That's Hadith Sahih of, of the great companion, radiallahu ta'ala, and that people who have the opportunity to take a picture, see the nature of the great art, they don't need pen and paper, all those people, why? Because they can etch reality upon their great souls. That's the nature of that great oral community that saying Abu Bakr and Umar and the likes were from. But others, like the Romans and others, literate people, literate people need some type of aid, physical aid, in order to remember things are gone. So they took a picture of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's the point? Which one of us could draw him from memory? Which one of us? If we can't, there's a problem with our religion. Because the companions did not preserve his form, except that it becomes etched inside of our reality. And when we have done our clue, we know what David Beckham looks like, but we have no clue what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, looks like, then we should not wonder when we see bombs dropping upon innocent Muslims. We should not wonder why, because our success is tied to knowledge of him, and his form is extremely important. You know his form, you begin to have some type of knowledge in the context of ignorance of his great and lofty and universal and unlimited reality. That is why we see the highest discipline. What is the highest discipline you can study inside of the, of the corpus of Islam? The relevant tells that the highest discipline you can study is a discipline that's called Haqqaliq al Muhammadiyah, the Muhammadan realities, studying the reality of that great. Blessed Messenger who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't descend to me and you, or didn't descend to the likes of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, or didn't descend to Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Fatima, Zahra al Batul, Khalil al Qubra, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, and but he sent him also to Jesus and to Moses and to Ibrahim and to Noah and to Adam, to each and every single one of the prophets, as recorded in the Quran, Mithaq al Nabiyeen, the contract, the covenant. Every prophet had to take over Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of us would be here unless that reality in the hadith in the Tabarani of Ka'b al-Akbar, the great Tabi'i 
second generation who he says he reports the hadith of Sayyidina Adam where he stands before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَتَلَقَّى Adam In Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Adam talaqqa kalimat Adam embraced words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and another reading of the Quran wasn't Adam who embraced the words the word embraced Adam that's a reading of the great seven readings of the Quran now what does Adam fataba alayhi then Allah we pensed him towards Adam had Allah not turned towards Adam we would be in a state of oblivion because it's that turning towards Adam that allows time to play itself out what were the words because they're very important words, isn't it? If it's words that caused all of this, what were the words? In the Hadith and Tabarani, it was when Adam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him, bi haqqi Muhammadin. By the right or virtue of the truth of Muhammad, the reality of Muhammad, to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Adam, Muhammad, where did you hear the word of Muhammad? To which whom? Saying Adam alayhi salam said, When I gazed upon your throne, I saw upon the great mighty throne that Satan unblazed the entire cosmos, that it says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And it, I knew that you would not co-fix any name with your name, except if that name was lofty with you, Muhammad, to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Na'am, ya Adam. Yes, O Adam, walawlahu ma khalaqtuka. If it was not for him, I would not have created you. That's who we're speaking about, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. All the disciplines, like the disciplines of his great Middle course, what they call the Mu'jizat of the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> And you hear some ignorant Muslims, which should refer to our ignorance often, so that we come out of that state, who will say that the Prophet Sallallahu has no real recorded miracles, or very few recorded miracles, or his only recorded miracle is the Qur'an. I mean, that's a real, that's a statement of absolute ignorance of who he is Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi has more recorded miracles than every prophet in history combined. Okay? And it's a great discipline to study the very miracles that the Prophet Sallallahu came with because miracles are very, very important. Over there, miracles only speak to a specific age, like the age of Moses is an age of great magic in ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. Egyptians have mastered magic still to this day. The wizards and the sorcerers and you see Blaine and all that people who study wizardry that they see as their great seller, the ancient Egyptians. That's why we see a lot of their mad folk that on the turn of the millennium, where would you find all of their mad folk? 2,000 recorded on the on New Year's Eve when the clock strike 12. They were all beneath the great obelisk in where? In Egypt, that's where they all stood. Going back to ancient Egypt. Eh? So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send to the ancient Egyptians? A great and mighty prophet called Moses son of Imran with mighty miracles that show you what that magic is false ultimately. Uh, that we sent in the context of magic and his miracles are those which manifest in the context of magic like the stuff that he threw down like his hand going inside of his of his of his jade inside of his, his garment and coming out illuminated likewise jesus in a time of medicine with what the Judaic people had mastered the art of medicine so jesus shows you a different type of medicine i'm going to bring the dead back to life the death baptism. And a very, very important miracle in our context because the whole story of Jesus being what? Crucified as an example on the throne. None of us as Muslims have really gone into what do we say about that which took place. We just know that he wasn't crucified. So what about in the Quran? وما قتلوه وما صلبوه ولكن شبه لهم That he was not killed nor was he crucified but it was made to seem as if he was. What does that mean? In a sense, that could actually validate the mistake of Christians inside of what believing Jesus was crucified, okay? But what is the belief of the Muslims that he was not crucified and when the Roman soldiers come to take Jesus, that what happens that Jesus, Allah through the miracle of Jesus transforms every single one of the disciples into Jesus from the top half up. So when the Romans can't distinguish who is it, which one is Jesus, they say either he comes out or we crucify every single one of you. And therefore one of the disciples steps forth as a martyr for the cause. And he is the one who is taken, 
placed upon the cross and crucified upon the cross. One of the disciples of Jesus. And then he is the one who is taking the temple mount. And then he is the one who is visited by Jesus who brings him back to life. Restores life in that individual. So he walks as a living man once again. That's important for us to understand that Jesus, as in the Quran, was given the ability to bring the life, the dead back to life, because that was the context he was sent in. The difference with the Prophet is what's his context? His context is universal. So he has miracles that will speak, maybe to particular places and particular times, but other miracles that will speak to other particular places and other particular times. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam wa fi akhirati wal ula. Other signs, we look at like the signs of Maghazi, the great wars that he partook in, and he was a prophet of wars. And none of us should make an apology for that. They don't apologize for Napoleon. They don't apologize for Nelson. They didn't apologize for the Iraq. So why then should we apologize for the fact that our Prophet وسلم, stood on a battlefield 25 times as a glorious prophet? You're never going to see in any culture, any culture in the human civilization, except that the greatest um, ethics of man, man as a male being, not as a female being, will relate to attributes that are only gained inside of war. That's it, all human civilizations. So why then should that should we be some type of exception or the prophets be some type of exception? So here's the case with the messenger of God so I said we stood on the battlefield twenty-five times, and likewise he sanctioned another twenty-two wars in which he never stood. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a great discipline. Another great discipline from Sira, again context for our Sira, or what we call Dala in Nabuwa. This is really important in our time. Prove he's a prophet. The man even asked to prove he's a prophet. We have a discipline of the great Imams who wrote in it, Imam al Bayhaqi, who has eight or nine volumes, volumes, and each volume twice the size of this book, which all is about the proofs of prophecy. And you want proof he's a prophet, not in a few pages, but in volumes, I will give you proofs that this man is a prophet. That is a discipline that we need to study and become familiar with once again. Many great disciplines. Another discipline that you also make mention of is Khasa'is. Imam al one of the great writers that was called Khasa'is and Nabawiyah. Ay Khasa'is looks at the elect qualities of the Prophet. So not just his life and times, not what he looked like, or all his qualities, all his wars, all his miracles, all the proof that he's a prophet. But now, what makes him stand out from all of the beings? Why is he special? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And likewise, that's another great discipline. Why would it on the day of judgment? You want to remember this? You want to find a prophet on the day of judgment? Look for one standard that is huge, that, it, that, that goes into the heavens. That is called the standard of praise. Liwa'alham. And the one who holds that standard is Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Adam, wa man dunahu tahta liwa'i yawm al-qiyam. Adam and everybody other than Adam will be beneath my standard on the day of judgment. The ulama have it that the standard of the Prophet being held with him, that's where you will find over 224,000 prophets who surround the Prophet on the day of judgment. Such so, as so you hear the great hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and others hadith, mutawatir on the day of judgment when all the creation begins to flee. To whom? To the prophets, in order for the prophets to intercede with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've got to know where to find the prophets. Remember, there's a lot of folks standing on that great plains on the day of judgment. Where do they find them? They gaze for what the standard. When they see the standard, they head for the standard. And there they will find all the prophets surrounding the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi So they'll go to Adam, and they'll go to Noah, and they'll go to Ibrahim, and they'll go to Musa as in the tradition, another tradition. Then they go to Isa. But ultimately, where they end up? At the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi where he said, Anna laha, anna laha. That hadith is so important. Why? The one who disbelieves in that tradition by consensus is not a Muslim. Because that hadith is at the level of the Quran. Impossible to reject, otherwise your faith becomes nothing. To reject that incident, that which is going to take place on the day of judgment. Why him over every other prophet that from his khasa'is? We've got to know why he is so special. Why that is a, such a special messenger. Because it's like one of, one of the great men of Islam who died in recent times, who wrote his book, which I have called the Muhammad by Martin Lings. Martin Ling said something interesting for each and every single one of us that our brother confirms here. 
He said that just bring my people Muhammad khalas, and the rest will take care of itself. That's it. Teach people about who he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you will see amazing, wondrous things take place in front of your very eyes. But we have to teach people with words, but also in, in embodiment, how we are. Otherwise, it's hypocrites, it's hypocrisy. Although the word of the Prophet would ordinarily yani, move swiftly towards the hearts of others, regardless of ourselves, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the famous verse of what? How of replacement, how we replace the likes of us with the likes of those yet to come who will give victory to this religion. So what we wanted to do in terms of this, um, inshallah, this, this, this sort of lecture was more sort of set a context for what we're going to study more so. Inshallah, in the next um, gathering that we have, we'll have slides, which inshallah will help sort of give people a greater context for what we're studying and what would be helpful for each and every single one of us. That these are not um, lectures in order to entertain, but we're trying to regain a glory that has what? Long been lost. And we need one of them things that the Prophet Sallallahu told us to have. He said, knowledge is like in prey, so use a pen in order to capture your prey, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said. So we need to have a yeah, yeah, pen or whatever, an iPod or something we can could, we could type notes upon. So we can review this and allow it to etch inside of our hearts. Critical, very, very important. You see, as like you said, that we've had enough of the days of entertainment. You see, I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say what they say about it to be true. For Michael Jackson has died, and let entertainment die with him. Let us walk, come back to the age of what? Of where we seek knowledge in order to gain proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inshallah, if anyone has any questions, inshallah, then we can open the floor, inshallah, for questions. You mentioned uh, about when Rasulullah was uh, created before absolutely everything. You mentioned something about the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I, I didn't quite grasp that. Uh, okay. I mean, the, the point is that when we speak about creation, okay, creation, what we mean by creation is everything, anything that has a beginning is creation. Anything that has a beginning in time is creation, or a beginning, that's what I'm saying, in time. anything that has a beginning is creation. Anything that has no beginning is creator. Okay? So here when we're speaking about creation and creator, when we see creation has a beginning, we mean in the world abstract, not inside of our intellects, not in our knowledge, but what abstract this actually exists. Although this computer may have existed at some time in my mind before I ever had it, I'm not speaking about what's inside of my mind, speaking about where it exists outside of me. Okay? So a lot of times when we speak about in theology, when they speak about in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and yeah, everything existed with Allah in, in His knowledge before it was even created. Okay? So when we say that the Prophet was a prophet when Adam was still being formed, we don't mean in the knowledge of Allah, because everything was in the knowledge of Allah at that point. So why would he single out I was a prophet in the knowledge of God? Well, so was Adam in the knowledge of God. So was Jesus. So was Moses. They were all prophets in the knowledge of God at that point in time. So he's saying something different. I was a prophet externally in existence. I, I actually existed. But the form was not in its physical form. It was in spirit. And that's all of us. All of us have a, an existence prior to our physical existence. Huh? This is should be common knowledge for it. It's had 120 days. That prior existence descends into our mother's womb. 120 days in gestation. That's something. That's when we become physical creatures in the world. But we were spiritual creatures prior to that, as in the basis of the Arab, which I'm used to that. Okay, the answer clear? What is the difference between Sirah and Fiqh Sirah? Uh, sirah is a discipline that has been agreed upon. Okay, it's a classical discipline. Fiqh Sirah is not necessarily a discipline. But Fiqh Sirah was like a, 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 a was an attempt by many scholars from amongst them the likes of Dr. Saeed Ramadan al Bhuti, the likes of um, the, um, the late um, Sheikh Mohammed al Ghazali uh, um, from Egypt, to, um, to, to look at aspects of the seerah um, which um, they could extrapolate law from or greater understandings of why certain events took place. 
Then it ends, it's, it's trying to look at the causative reasons, especially as it pertains to law and sometimes theology, on why events take place. That's what Fiqh is, but well, it's not strictly seen as a discipline. It's a new discipline. Maybe, you know, we wouldn't say it's a new discipline, we just say that it, it's a, a different look at the Sierra, but it could become a discipline. That's the nature of how disciplines are born. We talk about the four fathers of the Prophet Is there a hadith, I'm not sure about the authentication of that hadith, when a man took the Prophet and the Prophet said, my father and your father are not in his father. Yeah, the hadith, the hadith is there, hadith is sahih. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, my hadith, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when he passing by al abwa the, uh, the graveyard of his mother, he said, I ask permission of Allah to visit my mother. I ask permission to ask for forgiveness. And he said, Allah, let me for the first, but rejected the second. So, though his lineage is uh, a noble lineage, but still they are not Muslim lineage, some of them. I mean, I, I, that's, that's an issue of contention. What we would say, yani, in terms of looking at knowledge in its breadth, that the issue, in the, according to the Sunnah al mm -hmm. the issue of um, some of the forefathers of the Prophet Sallallahu and when I say some of the forefathers, in particular, is his parents, uh, and in particular, his lineage after Ibrahim, mm -hmm. that there are those who, who go against the majority. So we say what I said, it's not the consensus of the scholars, but it's the vast majority of the scholars that's very important. So there is opinions with regards to his mother uh, and his father, there is opinion, which that opinion in theology is thrown out absolutely with regards to his parents. Why in theology? Because his parents are from a generation that's called Ahl al Fetra. And Ahl al Fetra, according to the scholars of theology, are all forgiven. Well, no, Abidul Athnan, even if they worship idols, because Ahl al Fetra are a group of people who are between prophets. No prophet comes in Surah Yasin, no, they are Adam from Khafirun. Their forefathers were not warned, so they were heedless. And Allah promises in the Quran, We do not punish anybody until we first send the messenger. So, how could the parents of the Prophet be punished when they have no messenger sent unto them? So, here the scholars of theology will say that the parents of the Prophet, without a shadow of doubt, are people in paradise. And here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to visit his mother. Okay, he's not going to be able to, we're not allowed to visit the graves of disbelievers, never mind pray for them. So he was allowed to visit, but wasn't allowed to seek forgiveness because it was already guaranteed for it. That's how the relevant understand it. And if you want to study the parents in particular, you know, Suyuti, great half of the Suyuti, because they were on the last great profile of the Ummah, over 100,000 hadith by a man with the great Abdurrahman of Suyuti. He has nine, not one, not two, not three, Tisa'a Rasa'at. Nine treatises that he wrote on the parents of the Prophet ﷺ. He brought all the hadith that relate to the parents, even the hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we asked the Prophet in the, in the science of miracles, Tayyip, the Prophet, of Allah, does he have the miracles of Moses? Uh, does he have the miracles of Prophet Moses Khalid al Star? Does he have the miracles of Jesus? In Tisa'a al of the miracles of Jesus, which is bringing the dead back to life, he brought his own mother back to life at Abwa. Hadith is there and Suyuti brings it, brings his own mother back to life and then she utters the shahada tain and then Allah takes his soul. That's what Suyuti brings into Tisa'a al So it's, 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 a, it's a vast issue, but at the same time, we're not, uh, how can you say, but the tarsuk, possibly tarsuk. We have no bias, we're not extremists, we will present, I mean there are differences of opinion and there are great scholars who are, who, who Stated opposite to that, and from the, from them, the greatest of them, why not? Is the likes of Imam Nawi, Rabbi Allah Ta'ala, and no small fish, and now he's huge, and Allah so So we have to admit that there are those who go against the opinion, but then Prophet Sahih Islam said, Kunu, Ma'al Jama'ah, be with the vast majority. Should women be allowed to graveyard, to go to graveyards of family, relatives, and pious people? I mean, this is the question is, 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 a, is, a, is a fiqh question, it relates to fiqh. So I can only answer in accordance to the fiqh I studied, which is the school of Imam al Shafi'i, radiallahu ta'ala. And in that the Prophet said, on the basis of that, I used to prevent you from visiting graves. 
now visit graves منا يذكركم بالآخرة because it reminds you of the hereafter and here in the hadith that there is no specification of male over female right? the hadith in and of itself will allude to two things first and foremost it is recommended to visit graves recommended because in, 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 in legal theory of the Prophet begins with a negation and then he follows that with a command and in legal theory a command after negation alludes to something being recommended that's a legal principle. And likewise, you've got no taxis of it being men over women. There's, no, there's nothing here saying that it's only men or women, yeah, not women. So ordinarily, it's recommended to go, and it is for men and women to go, except in the school of Imam al-Shafi'i, it is dislike for women to go to, to visit with it. It's dislike. Okay, it's dislike. The reason why, because of the, the, the emotions of women. I, women ordinarily, uh, they are not having the mastery over their emotions that men do have. Uh, you can say, you know, in a sense, men are cold, women ain't. But being cold is sometimes a good quality at a graveyard, but that allows you to have adab with those who are in the grave. Okay? But what the school of Imam al he said that if a woman is somebody who can control her emotions, then it moves into the sphere of being permissible, even recommend a place to go into the graveyard to visit the pious. But the, the key point is she must control her emotions when she visits the grave. Is it just it's a lot as well as that has been created before Muhammad or all of us? No, no, is it just Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been created before Adam or all of us? I mean that that's sort of a, a different topic, a different topic, huh? But well, here when we speak about Sayyidina Adam, Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, without doubt, it's not open for question, is the first yeah, um, being created in terms of spirit and form. That's why he's our father in spirit and form. Uh, the human being is a juxtaposition of form, his physical nature, as well as soul, spirit, his ruh. Okay? So in terms of ruh, well, jasad, uh, and that's why in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I said, I was a prophet. I was a prophet. Kuntu Nabiyyan wa Adam and Adam bain al ma wa teen between water and clay. Munjadilan between atihi. Another version. He was still yani, intermingling inside of his clay. Clay was refers to form. In another narration of the hadith, wa Adam bain al ruhi wa jasad. Adam was between spirit and physical form. That's another narration of the same hadith which comes in a, in a, in a, in a Tabarani. Okay? So here, soul and physical form, Adam is the first. What we're speaking about here is the world of souls. Souls which are created entities. According to Abu Hamad al-Ghazali and the people of knowledge, that soul is a created entity. Okay? So that the Prophet وسلم, is the first soul created. And you'll find that especially in the, in the, in the hadith of the Muslim of Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani. Okay? As for the other prophets, we, we, we don't speak about that which we have no knowledge of. As-salamu alaykum, do you recommend any specific stuff? I mean, I, The Sea of Nectar, I mean, I feel that's a good book, and I have the book, but to be honest, I've never read the book. I skimmed through it, but I've never read it in detail, so I couldn't necessarily recommend The Sea of Nectar, but it, I've heard it's a good book. Okay? Martin Rings is a good book, I read Martin Rings. Although there are aspects in Martin Lings that are problematic, that are, that are problematic, okay? And so, you know, when one gets, follow your heart, the Prophet says, so you get to a point that doesn't feel right in your heart, then ask somebody, and I think you may know to clarify that. But Martin Lings, in a few places, has some um, strange opinions with regards to the Prophet Sallallahu but generally in English language, it's the best book <laughs> we have on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if people want to follow, you know, within the age of, one of the, one of the people, his name is Imam, he wrote, he wrote a, a real brilliant book in, in orality, the nature of orality, that people should read because it refers back to our tradition, our tradition being an oral tradition. That he calls something, he has what he calls primary orality and secondary orality. Primary orality is like the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, prim primary orality is when somebody has no frame of reference for writing and they don't even know what writing is. They have no frame of reference. It's not like they know how to read and write and they forgot. Or they see a reading and writing all around them, but they don't take no, you know, te they pay no attention to it. But in regards to the Prophet sallallahu so that's primary orality. Secondary orality, he said, I like our civilizations now. 
and say we're moving towards an age of secondary orality, that although that read, write books, we learn that in school, we're moving to an age where people are no longer going to read and write. Uh, that's what television, that's what internet does. It's, it's going <coughs> to strip that away from the human being. It's a very, I think it's a really important observation. Okay? Are you? So I forgot the point I was saying. So the, but the, point, the point being is that Martin Lings is a, is a sort of, is a, is a decent book. And, oh, sorry, yeah, is that Sheikh Hamza's tapes, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf who has his, his tapes, his, I think it's 24 or what have you, tapes, on the life and times of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi For those who are moving towards secondary orality, they may find that better than what than Martin Lings. So inshallah, that's another good thing. You mentioned that we must know the image of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So why is it prohibited to have images of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, because that's part of, because why? I mean, you read something like Ong's book, you'll understand what the printed word does. When they say like a word, uh, like a picture speaks a thousand words. Uh, you see, like words or pictures, forms by their by the innate nature, they begin to limit something that wasn't limited in that way in the first place. Because each and every single one of us, when we all to read the description of the Prophet of Islam, a master them in knowledge, that each and every single one of us possibly could manifest that in a different way. And ordinarily that different way is going to be a projection of our soul onto the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An example which was which I always found funny was it was an, an individual, a Dijal, he was a Dijal, one of the liar prophets, the prophet as I'm told would come. His name was Dr. York, yeah, he was a doctor, I don't know if he was from York, but he lived in Brooklyn, New York. Maybe that's why he called himself Dr. York. And he found a cult called the Ansar cult. Ansar cult. Any of our youngsters who were into rap music, if you look at the rap music of the 90s, of the 80s and the 90s, with the heavy influence by this cult rap music when rap music was supposed to be conscious. And the Kuli this Dr. York, who had a proper religious sect. And if you saw them in the streets of Brooklyn, New York, they dressed just like Sunni Muslims. They had turbans and, and, and folds and they had scarves and they would Assalamu Alaikum brother. And you could be fooled and many were fooled to think that these were the real deal. But they were Dijal, they were liars. Okay. So anyway, al have in one of his books, I, I, I read his works, Dr. York, in one of his books, Dr. York had a picture that only he had access to of all of the prophets. And it's funny, why? Well, because all the prophets look like him. <laughs> the prophets look like him, Jesus look like him, Moses look like him. They all look like him. You see, that is just a, down, a, a lie, obviously. But there's an element of truth in that. What's the element of truth? That Allah has prohibited images for the reason so we can relate to the prophets. Because with the Prophet Sallallahu the color of the Prophet, like an example, Abiyad. What's the color of the Prophet Sallallahu White. That's the color, Abiyad. Mushawash bil humra that had redness, tinges of redness in it. What does white mean? Example, if you study logic, the science of Montek logic, really important science in Islam, logic, they speak about words that have a definitive meaning. A user word, it means what it says. And words that have multiple shades of meaning. It can mean many different things. When they demonstrate a word that has multiple shades of meaning, the example they use is white. That's in the books of our, of our logic, like Isa Hoji and the Sunnah and the Munarak. These great books used to be in logic in Islam. That they're, they're going to show you a word that has multiple meanings is white. And I, and I experienced that I was in Mauritania. I was in Mauritania. I was in, I was in Mauritania once. I was there with a few, few brothers, some of like, like Yahya Rodas and others. We were in Mauritania, we were trying to build our tents in Mauritania. You had to go to the village, you had to buy all your wood and your material, not your wood, your material and all the stuff you need. Go back to the desert and then begin to construct your own tent you're going to live in. So we were there in, in the marketplace. So I'm there negotiating with this Mauritanian woman for some material. And she's striking a hard deal. So I've got to show that I'm from Liverpool and scouts don't take their pennies lightly. So then I started to negotiate a lot harder. And then, 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 um, then she started asking, where are you from? So I started the conversation. And then, and then, she, then I said, what about you? And she said, well, I'm so-and-so, and I'm white. And she said, I'm not bad, Barney, she said. I said, no, you're not white. <laughs> you are not white, believe me. She, she said, I'm not bad, Barney. And she kept on, I said, no, you're not white. You're, and that's the be very Barney. You're not white. And she kept on saying, and she kept, she kept starts getting mad. I'm not bad, Barney. <laughs> she getting really mad. And at this point, moment, like my friend Yahya wrote this, he walked past, and I said, Umbar, who are they, Dhani? That's white. She goes, hey, 
هو ليس بيضاني هو نصراني شيء هو not white he's a Christian that's what he said that's not white this is white what I look like which is what we call in our society black but in their society she was just lighter than black people so she's white uh, so the point being is that the Prophet Sallallahu being white is a beautiful description of him okay it's very beautiful because it allows every because every civilization has white people and although he's not like all of those white people but at least gives them something they can relate to with regards to the messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi pictures would destroy that like it destroyed Jesus when they painted Jesus Many cultures found that good reason to reject the blessed messenger of Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam. I read the Quran uh, more easily in phonetic English. I, I do about Arabic. Is this wrong? Um, what does phonetic English mean? Transliteration? Does that mean? Okay. Yeah, according again, it's fiqh according to the Shafi'i school that it's haram to read in phonetic English. That's what the Shafi'i school says. Because the Shafi'i school, and that is not the Shafi'i school, all schools of jurisprudence agree that the revelation of the Quran is not only in word, but it's in script. The script, okay? The script, and we don't mean the script with the fat dhammas or with the dots. It's just the shape of the letters without dots and without the lines of the diacritical marks. That shape is from revelation, so you can, it's untouchable, it cannot be touched. So to change that into Latin letters, that's what the translation would maybe what meant by phonetic English here. To change that is considered change in revelation with the Shafi'i school of Jordan students. So what I'd say is, is maybe ask somebody who studies in other schools whether it's permissible. What's the problem? And, and the point being, which I, I just learned in, in my own sort of, inshallah, learning of this religion, but I, I, in the beginning of my Islam, read with transliteration. And what I realized, that prevented me from learning Arabic, which is very easy to learn the script for years, because now I could read the Quran in transliteration, so I had no need to learn the, the Arabic script. And I have many teachers who, who, who taught the Arabic script people to read fluently inside of 10 days, 10 lessons. And it's not difficult. Allah says we've made the remembrance easy, and that includes reading, recitation, reading of the script which is the, the, the means to understanding it. Was the Prophet Islam strong physically? Yes, the Prophet Sallallahu had the strength of 40 men. All of the Prophets ordinarily have the strength of multiple men. The Prophet Islam had the strength of 40 individuals, of immense strength, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You mentioned that we must know the image of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we read that. And then can a newly can convert pray in English before learning how to pray in Arabic? Then we have to sort of, um, again, that retains to fit in the Shafi'i school. <coughs> no. In the Shafi'i school of Jordan students, and that's what I speak against, you can't recite in English. The prayer is in Arabic, and it cannot be placed into any other language. And if somebody does not know the Fatiha, then they in the Shafi'is, because they're new Muslims, they should either just make dhikr, like, SubhanAllah, 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 in them places, or they should remain silent. That's according to the Shafi'is. But they ordinarily have to begin the arduous task of learning it with the Shafi'i school of Jordan students having a specific period of time. And I think it's very, very important because in Western culture, you're a new Muslim for life. And where does that concept come from? In Shafi'i school of Jordan students, you're a new Muslim for six months. And then you're a Muslim. You can drop the new. So you basically got six months to sort of get, unless you live in a land where there's no scholars or you live in a land that's, that's far from the lands of Islam, you have an extension of that period. But if that's not the case, six months, and you better get with it. And, and we better get with it because usually it's, it's us who are more familiar with the religion, who abandon those who are new. A lot of times turn them the other opposite direction outside of the door. Inshallah. Is that a question? Um, is there any text that, that we're going to use? No, the, the thematic looks. So there is no text, although I'll give Javid a copy of this. This is what we use in the micro madrasa. Okay, it's a text by one of the great Hadrami scholars called Imam Bahraq. Imam Bahraq eh? And it's, it's basically a timeline of the seerah. And I think so generally what I moved in terms of these thematic looks is towards a timeline. Okay, so we'll look, look at the, the seerah in forms of timeline, although I'm not going to comment yeah, word by word as we do in the micro madrasa as an example on Bahraq's text. So, so, so basically in the next session this will be distributed so this text and maybe this will be a good sort of brief text one can read in order to sort of keep with it inshallah
How about a man who pierced his ear and realized it is forbidden to take the, take the earring out? And it's all good. How long does it take for a man to be mature enough to get married? Yeah. That's the question, isn't it? From Sira to Mari, see, I said Sira contains everything. What was the question? <laughs> so, how long does it take for a man to, to, to be mature enough to get married? That depends upon the man, that depends upon his environment. Ordinarily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a sign that what marriage, in, ordinarily in a healthy society, one is ready at the point of what? That you can procreate. That's what's called legal maturity in Islam. I, the point where you can be the causative reason for another being coming into existence, i.e. you can give birth, uh, or be the uh, male being the one who what, helps give birth in a sense, then what? Then you, in a sense, are mature enough to get married, although that's not the case in our societies that prolong childhood, okay? I mean, prolong childhood, like you, like you look at some of these like fashion now, there's a great, really good, brilliant book I once read called the ISIS Papers. ISIS Papers, we look at the psychology of modern culture, a particular specific aspect of modern culture. And what it looked at was more so how childhood had been what had been prolonged. And you could see that in the way people spoke and the way people dressed and people, people walk. Like we look at a lot of modern people, look how they dress. They dress like children. I mean, their trousers are halfway down their backside. They're showing their nappies. That's how children dress, and that's how modern man dresses in a fashionable sense. Isn't it fashionable to dress like that? Uh, that's problematic. It's a sign that mind people are not mature enough in order to what? One of them, one of them, one of the poets he wrote, babies having babies, and I don't know why. It's, that's what it is. Babies having babies, and it creates a crisis inside of our, our social habitats. So we've got to ask certain things about when we, are we mature enough. I mean, the Arabic language, they, mashallah, they have that in their, in, in their language. In, one of the, in the language of the Arabs, there's an actual, there's a, there's a form in Arabic, which if you use that form, it means you have reached an age where you are mature enough to be married. <laughs> you see, I mean, it's something that the human being writes a passage, has to, in a sense, head towards. You see, but we've lost all sense of that. So again, it's relative. Allah alam. A lot of times in our day and age, people got to be in their 60s to be mature enough. Allah salam wa I just have uh, another question. If somebody wants to, say, wants to acquire knowledge, but their parents, um, in a way, prohibit them, in a way, say they want to go to Amdurasa um, abroad, yeah. uh, but the parents say that we'd rather you study, uh, you know. Yeah, just tell, just tell your parents, I'm going abroad to become a doctor. You're not lying. It's just a different type of doctor. Uh, and, to, and to study with doctors, Allah and his mercy. Abu Bakr al-Sadiq, when he was dying, Abu Bakr, he said to Abu Bakr, shall we bring you a doctor? And he said, the doctor made me sick. That's what he said. And he meant by the doctor, Allah. Amradani Tabib Allah. That's what he meant, Rabbi Allah. So just khalas, use what they call a Torah, be slick with language. But the reality is, is that knowledge has, is classified in different um, classifications. What's called Farad Ain knowledge, knowledge which is obligatory for anybody to know, then nobody can prevent you from that, even your parents. It's not considered disobedience to parents for somebody to seek what is called obligatory knowledge. Anything which is not obligatory, even if it's highly recommended, it is disobedience to seek that knowledge without the permission of your parents. So what we say is that if it's, it's something that you have to know by the nature of what? The questioning on the Day of Judgment that you're ignorant of, then you don't let ta'atli makhlukin ma'ama asir al-khalid, the Prophet said there's no obedience to creation when it constitutes disobedience to the Creator. Okay, but that only knowledge only refers to obligatory knowledge. So what if, you know, the obligatory knowledge you can, just, you can acquire from books Locally, you can't. You can't. Books you can't acquire from books. Simple. Like so knowledge is taken from teachers. If you're gonna acquire it from so teachers, okay, say local teachers. Yeah, then you don't have to travel. And some scholars, yeah, I mean, some scholars, yeah, I, mean, I asked one of my teachers that, what about if, if somebody has teachers locally that they can study obligatory knowledge from, but they'd rather go to Damascus or Mauritania or Egypt or Yemen or what have you? Do they have Do, do they have good reason to? Um, 
to do that when you can see the locally. He said there's nothing in the books which stipulates distance. That, that, was, his, that was his answer to it. And that, that's all I paid for my teacher. There's nothing that stipulates, i.e. that there's nothing which says you have to go to the nearest teacher as opposed to the furthest teacher. There's nothing which says that in the books. Okay? Which in a sim what he's saying is that it's valid still for somebody to travel to the four corners of the earth, even for obligatory knowledge, even if he finds the best teacher that is in the world. <coughs> That's what, that's what, that's what I do. Uh, when the Prophet says, seek knowledge as far as China, would that include um, earthly knowledge or just Islamic knowledge? Tayyip, yani, in, in terms of seek knowledge, yani, well, in a scene, the hadith is weak, it's da'i, the hadith is weak. Although the scholars say the meaning is sound, i.e. that yani, seek knowledge even in China, even further in China. In sound, so but that hadith in of itself is weak. And ordinarily, whenever the Prophet ﷺ says al-ilm, see, we can't use that hadith as a dalil simply because of its of necessarily because of its weakness in terms of like as a strict law. Although now we know this, saying for that al-amal, that's what the scholars say in terms of good practice that you can't use weak hadith. But what's the point? If you use al-ilm, when the Prophet ﷺ says al-ilm, like utlub al-ilm, al-ilm, i.e. the knowledge, he means by that only sacred knowledge. When he says ilm without the al, he means that by any knowledge that is recommended. Okay? But ordinarily the ulama we're gonna allow people are gonna say that it's good for people to seek knowledge, even if it's if it's a, if it's non sacred knowledge, regardless of where that may be, so long as that is something that is recommended. And then the point being is that many of us have to understand what is recommended knowledge that is non sacred from the mundane and what is not recommended. We have to understand that also. Some of us may use that as an example to go I'm not saying to be advocated, but like in Greece, as we struck an example, to seek philosophy, and using the hadith, well philosophy by the, by the consensus of the ancient scholars is haram to study philosophy, haram, nobody says it, it's, it's permissible to study philosophy, so that hadith just doesn't act in their stead in that regard, why can't you not study from books? And, uh, you can't study from books because there's no guarantee that what you study from a book is going to be sound, Teachers guarantee the soundness of the transmission. Books are merely aids in that process. I mean, they aid the teacher. That's why. That's why the ulama say, "Kan al ilm fi sudur." He said, "Knowledge was in the breasts of men." Thumman taqal il sutur. Then it moved onto the pages of books. Walakin al rijal baqal mafati al ilm. But men and great women remain the keys to them books. So our knowledge is what? Is through human beings. That's the nature of this religion. Remember the Prophet Sadam and Bukhari? He says, Nahlu umma ummiya. We are an oral nation. And in case you want to, um, what does ummiya mean? It means oral. We speak and then we clarify it. La naktub. We're not people of books. Wa la nahsub. We're not people of calculations. That's hadith Sahih Bukhari. And the ulama like the Shah to be known with the Muwafaqat have commented on this hadith, the stamp of his ummah. We take knowledge from people, not from books. Books can just aid in that process, but we can't rely upon them. That's it. As a doctor, I am often faced as a dilemma on the day on the day of Jummah. I am on call and cannot leave my patients. I get covered at the time of Jummah prayer. I feel very guilty. Please advise. And uh, Alam. I mean, I, but my knowledge, I can't, I can't answer that question, inshallah. So I'll keep that question if you can ask in Kangara. What about the Dao? Can you do this? That is when they are holding the and what about Dawah? Can you do this without your parents' permission? That is when they are worried about your spendings, financial commitments, in regard to family, future, and savings. I mean, parents are extremely important. So the advice is not to do anything without one's parents' permission. Okay? Turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of times we forget. The reason why our parents don't change their mind on matters is because Allah doesn't change their hearts. Because we never petitioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dua that the Prophet sallallahu would say most often is greatest dua, Ya muqallib al qulub Oh, the one who changes or transforms hearts. That was a great dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had even Ahmed of Mother Aisha and Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. So we should become people who petition Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we have obedience to our parents, we are being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we petition Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon that obedience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to keep you inside of his obedience. So he will change their hearts so that you move into a new and more higher state of obedience. I mean, your, your parents that don't have rock solid hearts, 
He have hearts that love their children. So people should go to the one who ultimately loves all of his creations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll see the hearts will be transformed. Try it. That's what the ulama say. A lot of times they'll say, khalas. Ulama will say, look, I'm giving you this advice, but try the advice. Because thousands, millions have tried it and they've seen that it's worked. So why should we be any kind of exception? Let's call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of our affairs. Same answer. If it's fardain knowledge, then, then there's no difference between male and female in terms of fardain knowledge. Okay? Although the scholars, there is differences of opinion on that. Like in the books of the Lord, the high books of the Lord Shafi, there are differences of opinion on whether. Because the issue is not more so about your parents here, it's more so about the issue of mahram, of, 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 of legal escort. Okay? As you leave it without your parents' permission, it's part of that knowledge, women are the same as men. Any restriction a woman has in that instance alone is the issue of what? Of a legal escort. If she has a legal escort, then she can leave. If she doesn't have a legal escort, then the scholars of Jordan students in Shafi'i Malhab are on, are on a difference of opinion. And difference of opinion it relates to whether so a woman can, when can a woman travel without a legal escort. That's what it relates to in the Shafi'i school. Hajj they agree upon, other acts they disagree upon. And the same applied in the last answer, the sister should petition Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, our women, they have, a, you know, in terms of the first generation, I, the generation of teachers of the Sahaba, they have the greatest in legacy in our mother Aisha. Our mother Aisha was the greatest teacher of all of the Sahaba. She produced the greatest scholars of the next generation, Aisha al-Aisha. So the women have a greater legacy even than the men in terms of non-profits. Although the legacy in the Prophet وسلم, who in that real the reality is beyond gender, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is beyond and cult, but in khalas, the, the legacy is also there for men also. Right? Yeah. It's the same answer. It's the same answer. If it's fardain knowledge, then, then there's no difference between male and female in terms of fardain knowledge. Okay? Although the scholars, there is differences of opinion on that. Like in the books of the Lord, the high books of the Lord Shafi, there are differences of opinion on whether. Because the issue is not more so about your parents here, it's more so about the issue of mahram, of, 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 of legal escort. Okay? As you leave it without your parents' permission, as far as I acknowledge, women are the same as men. The only restriction a woman has in that instance alone is the issue of what? Of a legal escort. If she has a legal escort, then she can leave. If she doesn't have a legal escort, then the scholars of Jordan students in Shafi'i Malhab are on, are on a difference of opinion. And difference of opinion it relates to whether so a woman can when can a woman travel without a legal escort. That's what it relates to in the Shafi'i school. Hajj they agree upon, other acts they disagree upon. And then the same applied in the last answer, the, the sister should petition Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, our women, they have, a, you know, in terms of the first generation, I, the, the generation of teachers of the Sahaba, they have the greatest in legacy in our mother Aisha. Our mother Aisha was the greatest teacher of all of the Sahaba. She produced the greatest scholars of the next generation, Aisha al -Aisha. So the women have a greater legacy even than the men in terms of non-prophets. Although the legacy in the Prophet wasallam, who in that real, the reality is beyond gender, sallallahu is beyond and cult, but um, khalas, the, the legacy is also there for men also. Right? Yeah.